Okay, folks. Uh, there's one or two more seats around the front, uh, please, if you want to get comfortable. You won't be able to make notes if you're standing up. So do come and fill in these seats. Right. My name's Richard Self. Uh, I live in Office E516 uh, with many <coughs> colleagues from Computing and Mathematics. And welcome to Intro Computer Science. <coughs> I'm taking the Monday lecture, this one, all the way through the semester. Well, most of the time I'm not at a conference. And I will be looking after the workshop tutorial sessions on Tuesdays, um, starting next week. Uh, due to the fact that we've got quite a lot of you guys, um, we need to reschedule all of the workshops because we aren't going to be able to run 10 sessions or 11 sessions uh, on a Monday, on a Tuesday. So we're having to readjust things. So Wayne Ribbon is sorting that out. So we'll start with the uh, workshops and tutorials next week. How many of you have actually used your wonderful new access to the University of Derby system and got to this page here at derby.ac.uk? That's where you're going to start with. And have you discovered that if you click on this one, <coughs> a bit of luck. Yeah, kind of work here. Firefox and um, Chrome are better environments. Now, this is the version that you see, I see, our academics and I see a different version. But the place you really want to go to is ignore almost all of this. You can go in here to course resources, or sometimes we call it Blackboard, um, but that's where you want to go. This, by the way, is something you'll probably look at once or twice a year, uh, come around sort of February and <coughs> May or June after your uh, work has been assessed. And where I want to take you is to the most useful one, the launch pad, which kind of integrates everything nice and simply for you. Probably. Um, I'll be going to this one in a little bit. But for, to start with, I'll go to here, to course resources. And if you're in Internet Explorer, you will have to re-log in when you click here. If you're using <coughs> Firefox, may or may not go straight in, and Chrome may or may not take you straight in. It's kind of a bit iffy. smaller than that. Um, the one we're looking at today is Introduction to Computer Science. And each of your modules will have this sort of structure. So you can see on the your left hand side at the top, um, now if I just switch it into edit mode off then you'll see it almost exactly as you will see it. So you've got module info, study materials and so, something to do with your online reading list. Um, you probably won't have the module management stuff at the bottom, most likely. The module info chunk has something called the module handbook. And for every one of your modules, you will have something in that folder, the module info folder, which basically gives you a feel for what you're going to be studying during that particular module, that particular semester. So first of all, I want to introduce you to this particular module, which is used by pretty much all of the students doing the computing side of the programs for computing and maths. Two <coughs> Wayne Ribbon and me. And we do different things. Wayne on the Wednesday session does all the bits and the bytes and the technical stuff about what computer science is. 
and his material is assessed in a computer-based test worth 50% of your module score, um, either at the end of this term or early in January during the um, exam sort of period. I teach a different set. I teach you how to become amazingly good students and ultimately great employees. Because we focus very much here in the University of Derby on employability. One of the things that we pride ourselves on is the fact that our students in computing and maths get very high levels of employment after you graduate. Part of that's because uh, in your third year, you, most of you will get a work placement for one year out there in the big wide world and most of you who go on the placement will get a job as that employer. That's what history says. You do a great job during that year, you will almost certainly be offered a job. So I'm going to concentrate on the things that make you really employable so that come a little bit later in this next year, as a second year student, you will be able to apply for jobs your staff of in what is uh, June, July, August 2017. And I'm looking providing you with all the skills that you're going to need to become really good and really successful in your academic work and then ultimately out into the big wide world. Just remember that the module code is 4CZ509, and that kind of uh, code will get you into various places for finding information in our systems here. Now, Wayne lives down in B208, and that's on the right at the far end of B2, uh, B2 floor, past all of the computing labs. And he's in there with two or three other colleagues, Tommy Thompson from the little games and CGP, uh, CGP side, uh, and Dave Vorkis, who is there on the computer science side, and uh, Chris Morrison, Chris Morris, who is on the CGMA sort of side. So games, you've got two guys in there on the gamesy sort of thing, and two guys on the computer science side. And then I'm up on uh, 516. So, <coughs> two lectures each week. <coughs> Here on Monday, and that's about skills. And then I forget where it is, it might be here again on uh, Wednesday about bits, bytes, technicalities, and technical things. So we've got two lectures a week that all of you go to, and then you will see in the timetable a nine hour slot from nine o'clock until finishing at 6 o'clock on Tuesdays as a big block. Now, you will be split up into nine groups and we will publish that list during the next few days once we find the right lab to be able to do it in and you will just have to turn up for one of those sessions. You're not expected to spend all nine hours on a Tuesday in the labs. We don't have space for that. You will have an opportunity to come to us, to me, for one hour each week. I will be there for around about six weeks, and then Wayne will provide a drop-in sort of service for the other six weeks. We will not have one, as I say, tomorrow, <clears throat> and then there will be a couple in October, towards the end of October, early November, where I shan't be around. And so that will be Wayne's drop-in sessions, and then I will have the next two after that, leading up to the submission of your first uh, part of your assignment, which I'll talk about in a minute. There are two assessments, or two parts, to the assessment. It's a portfolio, as we call it. So you will only see one mark at the end when we finish the assessment and it goes to the exam board and there will be just the one mark. 50% of which comes from this first uh, the article I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. And then the other 50% come from this, which is a computer-based test. I'm not going to give you 
all the details about the article just now, but I just wanted to make, uh, point out that it's for an online journal, and each year we take the best of those that score 60% or more, and one or two of you will volunteer to edit those into an electronic journal um, entry or ebook. We've got one up there. The second one from last year is currently <coughs> in development and will be published in a little while. The topic list for this year has changed from the preceding two years. You can actually go and I'll show you where to find in a minute the uh, 2013 version. <coughs> and it'll give you an idea about the sort of things that could be done. And the advantage to you having it published online in the School of Computing and Maths Open Journal System is that if you get it published there, i.e. 60% or better, you can actually claim on your CV a publication. There are no other universities or schools in universities where their first semester students in their first year end up with a publication that they can claim in their CV. This st sets you out as different from every other student that you will ever come across. Those of you who are doing the BSCIT, hands up. You will get opportunities to be published or to publish, have your work published next year in the IT Services Management module, and then you will have a couple of opportunities in your final year as well, at least, if not three. And then the best of you who get 70% and above in your final year in your dissertation project, those dissertations are also publishable, subject to you deciding you want your dissertation published. Kind of useful to have it published. <coughs> those of you who volunteer to edit this little book, e journal, will be able to also claim editorial rights in your CV. Again, another thing that will set you out, set you apart from all of the other <coughs> candidates for jobs that you will be applying to in the future. So, first year, 60% and above, second year for IT services management, uh, for, yeah, IT services management for IT students, 65% and above, and final year, uh, it will be 70% and above. And that goes also for your dissertation. of books I do want to um, highlight to you. For the technical <coughs> side, Wayne is recommending this book um, as a kind of useful thing that you will want to record. Now, you don't need to write it down, guys. You can go on, when you get into the module on Blackboard, on print resources, you will find <coughs> this document and you will leave and you'll be able to find the actual details here. As Wayne says, it's quite an old book, but the important thing about old books is actually they can be quite good. When I and Wayne started on our career, and as we went through the sort of 70s, 80s, 90s, we had user manuals, proper user guides, reference manuals, language reference manuals. Now, even for our cameras, we used to get quite decent little booklets that told us how to use it. Today you buy all these Wizzo gadgets. Who's got an iPhone, an iPod? How many of those came with a, a proper user guide, a proper user manual? <coughs> some of them have some sort of interestingly difficult to read PDFs you can download if you go to the manufacturer's website. <coughs> a book like this, quite old, may well be, but it gets you to the heart of coding. You also need, and one of the things I point out while at the very beginning here is that many, many things have changed in the world of computing over the last 20, 30, 40 years. But a lot of things haven't changed. Among those is the fundamentals of good coding, 
That's never changed. It's all the same as it has been for 40 or 50 years. The other thing that hasn't changed are the questions about what to do, how to do it, when to do it. The questions have not changed in, to my knowledge, 40 odd years since I've been involved in the world of IT, systems analysis, and all of those things. The questions are the same today as they were back then. Even in networks and security, all the same sort of questions. The answers are completely different. The answers are also different today depending on the context. If you're in this company, or this university, the answers almost certainly will be different from any other university because of the context, the network set up and so on. So what you want to concentrate on are good practice, the best ways of doing things, and learning the really important questions. As we go through the, this, my side of things, the skills and employability and so on, for the next 12 lectures, you will find that I very rarely will give you any answers. If I give you an answer, they say you stop learning. And for identifying the really great answer <coughs> is what's important to learn. Because that will set you up for life. It will help you to learn for life, because it will help you to identify what you've got to go and find out. So the second part, second pair of books, is, are these two. Stella Cottrell's book, Critical Thinking Skills. It's all about finding the right questions and how to compare and contrast <coughs> lots and lots of evidence to come up with a good answer. In our field, we will very, very rarely have the time, the resources, or the need for the best answer. We need to look for good answers. Some of you may have heard people talking on the radio at times, or in other circumstances, about best practice. It's unachievable in most cases. So let's look for good practice. Because most people will never be able to achieve best practice. Because as you get more and more people going to that end, best practice keeps sliding away from you. At the top, say, 1% of practice. And not everybody can achieve being in that 1% out of a population of 100%. It's kind of a crazy concept. So good practice, good answers is what we need to be looking for. This one will help you to uh, tackle that. Part of the <coughs> emphasis, particularly in the U UK and most of the rest of Europe, <coughs> at the undergraduate level, is learning this thing called critical thinking. In many respects, we have no interest whatsoever in the facts that you can find online, in the facts that you can remember. What we are interested in is what you do with those facts, with your knowledge. <coughs> so, one of the things that Stella Cottrell's book is really great for is helping you to understand what critical thinking is, and that's the hallmark of a good European education. Many parts of the world, they concentrate purely on factual knowledge, and they test how much knowledge you've remembered. What we are interested in, what you can do with it, and how you apply it to get those really good answers in a particular context. So this is, if there's a book I recommend that you buy today or tomorrow, it's this book. This will set you up, in many respects, for the rest of your university career. There's another book, and <clears throat> although it's called The International Student's Guide, and it was written very much to help 
undergraduates arriving in the UK from particularly um, parts of the world where they teach you how to learn and, and have a great memory. I mean, there are parts of the world where students are taught how to have a perfect memory. Students from those countries can repeat back to me in my, using my word structures, my words, but not necessarily my intonation or accent, but they can quote back to me three, four, five weeks later exactly what I said during a lecture or a seminar. I don't remember the precise words that I have used two minutes ago. And I bet that's the same for most of us here, because we've mostly grown up in the UK where we are not taught to have perfect memories. But they can do it from what they've read, what they've heard, what they've seen. Most of us can't do that. Now, <clears throat> so this book was written very much to help people from that sort of background to understand what's going on here in a UK university environment. However, it turns out that this is actually a very, very good book for people brought up in the UK and Europe to help them understand themselves as they move into university. The questions it asks of the students from that international environment actually are incredibly relevant. So all of us, I wish I'd had that book when I was at university a very long time ago. So I would recommend getting hold of that book as well, um, because that will really help you to really get to grips with where things like when is the best time to do studying, to do reading, to do my other work, when's the best time not to work at all, how do I take part in seminars, how do I take part in tutorials, how do I actually maximise the benefits of all that money that each of you is paying be here for each of those years of study that you're doing. Really, really valuable these two books are. So I would recommend actually those three books that are on here that are really important for helping you to understand <coughs> what the next three years are going to be about in terms of technical stuff, in coding, in terms of critical analysis, and in being a really good, really engaged <coughs> student taking part in all of the activities contributing in terms of the group work, and so on, and so forth. So that's the introduction to the module. Then in study materials, <coughs> you've got a couple of chunks there. So there's one um, for me, and one for the Thursday lectures. Sorry, not Wednesday, it's Thursday lectures for you. <coughs> A couple of reminders, well, a reminder about backing up your work. Now, I'm sure many of you will be using memory sticks or encrypted hard drives or something like that. But we also have uh, opportunities on the, once you get into the computing network, something called the T drive. You will also, going into, um, through here, you will also have access to, I think it's called the U drive, where you'll be able to store a relatively small amount of data, back it up. Because one of the things we do not allow you to do is to come to us two days before you have to submit some work and say, Richard or Wayne or whoever, um, I've had a problem, my memory stick dropped down a drain hole or the dog ate it and crunched it or, or, or. Or my PC got a virus and it wiped out everything that's on its hard drive. That is not one of the acceptable reasons for having an extension. <coughs> it will be, oh dear, what a pity. So make sure that you back up your work all the time. One of the best ways that I've come across 
that I use much of the time, particularly when I'm developing really important work such as you know, papers to go to conferences or to journals and so on. Here's the name, a nice explanatory name, nice longish name in English, um, so I can work out what it is in a proper folder, in a sensible folder. And then the last six digits, or seven, sorry, seven digits of the file name then become the year, 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 day, uh, month, month, day, day, followed by a lowercase or uppercase alphabetic starting at A. And every hour on the hour that you're working on that document, file save as and change the A to a B to a C to a D to an E during the day. When you finish the work on that document, just before you finish, another file save as to the next letter, and then make sure that that last letter version is put somewhere else. You've got it on your memory stick or your hard drive, copy it from the hard drive to your memory stick perhaps, copy it onto your T drive, your U drive, or email it to yourself using your uh, Unimail account, because it's going to stay there. If you're using some, one of the other big cloud storage systems, shove it out there as well. Because if your PC dies, or you drop or lose, or smash your memory stick, or your hard drive <laughs> dies, you've got two or three other versions out there. And you, because you've got that date stamp at the end of the file name, you will always know when you created it. You cannot rely on the date of creation or modification that Microsoft File Manager shows you. It's all sorts of random sort of times and so on, ultimately. So if you put a date stamp in your file name, it will always A, sort itself in the right sequence and you'll always know which is the last one you created before you blue screened or lost your things. So, a T drive is another useful place you can put it in. The backing up is absolutely vital. You will have, see on my folder all of the materials you, you will want to use during the next 12 weeks. <laughs> on a couple of weeks, I will be doing the Thursday session as well, and on the weeks before that, Wayne will be doing this session, so you get the 12 from each of us. So you can see there's an introduction about what the module is all about. <coughs> next week, we'll be looking at researching and writing, because your assignment, your article, you're going to need to research and research and research, lots of research to get the knowledge <coughs> that you will need to write a really good article. Week three, we'll be looking at the question of how do you structure a report, an article. Then, the week four session is about learning. How do we go about learning? How do we work out when the best time to do different sorts of activities is? Another little section all about communication as it um, relates to formal report writing. Communications, we'll be looking at making notes and becoming employable, being great employable. Week nine is quite fun. We're looking at who we are and not beginning to understand ourselves and others around us in a way that many of you have never looked at yourselves before. Week 10, we look at presentations. Week 11, we look at something that's important to all of you, this SOFIA um, framework, the skills for an informational age. And what we'll be looking at on in week 11 is how, what it is, what it does, and why it's important in relation to two things. Well, three. One is about what sort of job do I really want? Am I on the right program even? Or should I move from one, the program you're currently enrolled on, onto something else? Because as you look at where the skills are leading you to, in terms of jobs, you may decide that you want to change. A second use is to use it as a skills audit to see how good am I at this, 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 and this? Do I like this, this, and this? 
what do I need to do to improve these elements? A gap analysis and a plan for the next year, year and a half, two years. The third part is that Sophia is used by many, many employers in the computing and IT world to specify the skills and the level of skill that is needed for a particular job. <coughs> so understanding Sophia would be really valuable in terms of thinking forward to applying for your placement job. It also allows you to identify during this year and next year the level of skill and the evidence of that, your claim so that when you actually apply for a job, you don't have to waffle. You say, you ask for these skills at this level, I have this skill at this level, this is the evidence. I've got this one at this level, here's the evidence. And that makes it very, very easy for them to look at your CV and your job application. Ah, right, put it into the to an interview. If you waffle, if you haven't got evidence, it'll go into the round out bucket over there. No interview. And one of the things you need to be doing is get that evidence against the levels and against the skills so that ah, they automatically have to interview you makes it much easier for you, and you'll get a job that way. <coughs> and then probably in week 12, we haven't arranged it quite yet, we'll probably have an, one of our um, employability advisors from the library area come in to talk a little bit about building your networks, the sort of things that are important as you build your networks um, on the social net media, such as LinkedIn, um, and sort of things you need to think about in terms of your Facebook accounts, perhaps, that might be a bad idea if you want to get a good job. So I won't um, preempt what we said there, but that's the sort of outline of what I'm going to be take, taking you through over the next 12 weeks, or 12 lectures, should I say. downloads quicker from home. <coughs> Added to which, course resources Blackboard are being hammered at the moment because we've got every new student in the university, returning new student and so on, and staff all busy trying to do things. So it kind of gets a little bit slow at times. But you can download all of these uh, sets of slides uh, <coughs> to your heart's content. Probably easier to have them done. And while we're waiting for it, I'll mention the video camera over there. I should be videoing all of my lectures, and we'll be posting them up on the Computing at Derby YouTube channel. And you can actually go to, to see what I said in last year's uh, lectures, again, for this module. In fact, you'll see all of the modules that I've taught, and one or two other modules that other people have taught on the Computing at Derby YouTube channel. This is one of the bizarre aspects of uh, Internet Explorer. It wants you to log in yet again, and it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Slight diversion. Digression. 
What is the purpose of I oh, what is the main value or function of IT these days, folks? Does it make our lives easier or what? Convenience. Convenience? Pardon? Automation. <coughs> Automation. Time saving. Time saving. Productivity. Productivity. Was that an example of a productivity improvement there, requiring me to find a hidden window that I couldn't see? Over the last couple of years, I've been involved in a lot of various conferences about big data analytics, information governance, and so on. One of, a couple of times to one of the largest IT analytics conferences in the world, um, run by IBM. I've been in this field since 1969. I was born two years before the first commercial computer was actually created by the Lions company called Leo. So I have existed through the entire time of commercial computing. Interestingly, at those big conferences, there is a general perspective that IT today is more fractured, more unreliable, and more complicated than it has ever been. In the last 20, 18 years, since ERP systems have been created, although someone said improve productivity, Interestingly, in fact, if I go back even further to the introduction of word processing back in 1985, 86-87, when I was working at Rolls-Royce Aerospace, initially word processing was done by the typists and the exec PAs and so on. <coughs> and they were paid at a, a rate, you know, equivalent today to a little, well, the typists, round about just a little bit above minimum wage. Not a little bit above, so they call it 10 quid an hour today's term. What has been spectacularly interesting is that today we don't have typists anywhere virtually. All of us do our own typing. And almost none of us, and I include most of you I suspect, know how to touch type without watching your fingers. How many can touch type? Wow! You actually had a formal lessons on touch typing you've kind of talked yourself. So what speed do you reckon you can accurately touch type at without going back and correcting anything? 86. Pardon? 86 words a minute. You've got 86. Brilliant. Anybody else up to 80, 70 or 80 words a minute? 10, 20, 30 words a minute? 60. <coughs> okay. Well, I congratulate you all then if you're up to 40, 50, 60 words a minute. Trained typists could type at 120 words a minute, the best ones. They could take bird tracks, dictation at 120 words a minute, so net 160 words a minute. And most of the people who started typing their own documents back in the late 80s, early 90s, were running at 10 and 20 words a minute, net. So you could, and they were probably on salaries two, three, four, five times the salary of the typists. So productivity, a third of what the typist could do, and pay rate of three or four times, kind of is not necessarily an improvement net in productivity terms. And one of the things you'll learn, probably you'll tip over, certainly the IT students will, is the uh, IT productivity paradox, which kind of looks at some of these questions, which is why it is that we cannot find, in most cases, applications of IT to the business world where we can truly put our finger clearly on real productivity improvements. Yes, we can do things quicker. Often that's then burnt up by doing the same analysis three times rather than how we would have done it <laughs> once. So, just have a think about what it is we think what you think about the value of IT and computer science.
I've emphasized one particularly bad area. There are actually many, many very interesting and very valuable positive aspects in the way that we can get better and more interesting insights in terms of making decisions on occasion. We are very bad, actually, as humans, in doing that. But there are some really great examples of things that are fantastic. Things we couldn't have done without IT. So think carefully over the next two, three years about the people, <coughs> folks. Because you're going to be instrumental in three years' time, well, yeah, three years' time, helping to make some job, uh, companies better when you're out there. And then when you get jobs, it's going to be up to you to find the ways that actually embed the great things that IT can do if we are really careful. If we're not careful, and I'm talking about the security uh, networks people, we can cause havoc. Last year, in 2014, about a billion and a half people had their IDs uh, stolen or credentials stolen over the internet. That is something like 20% of the population of the world have lost credentials, had these hacked. And it's getting worse. And the predictions are that this year is going to be even worse than last year. I want to talk very briefly about things that are important about studying here. But your commitment here at the university. One of the things we notice regularly is, yeah, there's a fabulous attendance today. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven or twelve people standing. We should have got about another twenty or so people in here. By the end of term, in previous years, there won't be anybody standing or, or sitting around the edges. You kind of evaporate into thin air. I will, however, remind you what you have signed up for on your enrolment form that you processed, you signed last week, and then took along when you actually signed up. You signed up to attend all lectures and seminars or workshops as scheduled. We expect you to do some preparation. I should give you a little preparation for next week that you need to do over the next uh, seven days. And you are required. You signed up to participate in seminars, that's discussions and tutorials, that's where you're in the labs and uh, doing things there. And even in this semester, you may find that you're required to either work together or individually to produce a presentation. to learn everything you need to know to pass your assignments and assessments just in the lecture or lectures or the seminar or the workshop. You need to do a lot of other work as well. That's the preparation and so on we'll talk about. I don't know whether this was mentioned in the induction period, was it? As we mentioned, I won't go on about it, that we will be using oh, this gadget in a couple of minutes to record all of you. And you'll come out of this store and I will zap your, um, your, your student card to record your presence. And that is how we will know about that. So if you could get your cards out now, then we'll be able to process it fairly quickly in a couple of minutes or so. I won't show you to talk about this one, but I'm reminded about it, and it's there, as you saw, in course resources. Anybody from overseas, particularly international students with a visa, will need a very good attendance record to get your visa extended. <coughs> Now, before you start moving, oi, what I want you to do this week
I want you to go to this page here, so that's on Launchpad, Study <coughs> Skills, Citing and Referencing, and then work your way through Plato. It will teach you the important things about identifying where you got your sources of information from. You do that in two places. One in the text with a citation, and we use a Harvard standard here. And then you also put information in the bibliography at the end of your piece of written work. And there you will list your sources by surname of the author or authors, the year it was published in, and then the title. And this piece of work here, or this tutorial here, will take you through all the things you need to know perfectly. It is important that you become totally automatic in terms of citing and referencing. So there are two parts here. One is on citing and referencing, and that is the really, really important part that you become perfect on. The second part of it is how to avoid plagiarism, which is essentially an academic offence where you have used other people's information, other people's uh, work, but yet claiming it as your own because you forgot to put a citation and a reference. It also will take you through various other aspects of stealing information, sharing information, and so on, in terms of academic um, affairs. So I want you to go through both parts of Plato before next week. Okay, folks? Right, I will now zap you.